Hello viewers, and welcome to the latest installment of the LOTR LCG Progression Series, a production by Cardboard of the Rings, the bi-weekly podcast about the Lord of the Rings, the card game, which is a living card game by Fantasy Flight Games. My name is Mitch. And my name is Matthew. Today, we're going to be taking a look at our latest hero and nine new player cards of our Encounter at Amon Den Adventure Pack, the third entry in the Against the Shadow cycle of Adventure Packs. So Matthew, why don't you start us off? The new hero for this pack is Pippin, a spirit hero with a threat cost of six, two willpower, one attack strength, one defense strength, and two hit points. Pippin is, of course, a hobbit. And his card reads, if each hero you control has the Hobbit trait, Pippin gains response. After an enemy engages you, raise your threat by three to return it to the staging area. Until the end of the round, that enemy cannot engage you. At this point in the game, there are only two other Hobbit heroes, uh, Bilbo and Frodo from the Shadow of Mirkwood cycle. Of course, there is the Bilbo from the Hobbit Saga expansions, but I'm not quite sure that he should count. So that would make for a total of two spirit hobbits and one lore hobbit. I certainly think this is an interesting ability, but it comes at a hefty price. Three threat to delay something for a turn, I, I'm not so sure if that's worth it or not. Certainly in multiplayer, it could result in some interesting engagement checks or just, you know, the, your buddies taking the enemy the next turn or something. But in a solo game, continuously raising your threat only to then have to deal with the enemy again the next turn, I, I'm not sure how I feel about it. We do know that the Black Riders expansion is coming up that has five Hobbit heroes in it, a, a second version of Pippin, so perhaps when Pippin has more options than just the original Bilbo and the original Frodo, things could be different, but I just really don't know how I feel about this particular hero. Mitch, what do you think? Well, I think the major limitation at this point is the Hobbit trait in and of itself is relatively underdeveloped. So just like you pointed out, to use Pippin, you have to use the only Hobbit heroes we have available to us for general play. So you're using Frodo and Bilbo. So the three of these together have 22 starting threat, so you're not underneath that secrecy threshold to start, and your threat is only going to climb higher and higher as you're triggering Pippin's ability, as you're maybe triggering Frodo's ability. So you certainly have a little bit more leeway in threat than some other decks do, but Bilbo in particular is by no means a low threat hero, and I think that between both of our spirit hobbits, your threat can still get out of control pretty quickly. Uh, this effect strikes me as a repeatable A Light in the Dark, which is a very rarely played player card. There are certainly some combos that go well with this. If another player has Dune here attacking into the staging area, or if they have Bard the Bowman using Great U-Bow, then this can actually end up being pretty useful. I think my major problem with Pippin is that the Hobbit deck itself at this point only really has ways of delaying the inevitable. So they're reliant on effects like Out of Sight, where enemies engaged with you can't attack. Maybe Gildor's Council, so that you're revealing fewer cards off the top of the encounter deck each turn. So, apart from having a few different effects that stave off enemy attacks, the Hobbit deck itself, especially in a solo player game, doesn't really have a lot of long-term means of dealing with what comes off the top of the encounter deck. I think although this card certainly can help to prevent some hero deaths, save the lives of some chump blockers, there are nevertheless a large number of cards we're starting to see in Heirs of Numenor and Against the Shadow, where once they engage with you, they bring some sort of nasty effect with them, like the Losernok Bandit that drains resources and the Zealous Traitor that deals damage to allies. This effect is after an enemy engages with you. So at that point, in certain scenarios, the damage is pretty much already done. I do feel like this is a very high threat cost for his ability. And until we see more, better Hobbit tricks, 
I'm pretty reluctant to play him. I mean, he's pretty much a dedicated questing character, but he only has two hit points, so if there's something like Dark and Dreadful coming off of the encounter deck, he's at a pretty significant risk without any sort of hit point increase. The Hobbits do have access to cards like Boots from Erebor and Ringmail, but again, unless you're relying on another player's help, you don't really have any means of getting Tactics cards into play. And even though you'll have Bilbo Baggins in play, access to the Lore Sphere, being able to afford cheap effects like Fast Hitch that give Hobbits additional actions, I just don't really see like you're getting much benefit out of a hero like this. So you certainly can't go wrong with his threat cost, but that ability at this point, it just seems like it's going to result in some very long, very drawn out, painful losses. I think maybe the only real redeeming value of Pippin is that as a spirit hero, he does have access to a lot of powerful in-sphere, threat reduction, threat mitigation type effects, and spirit generally does do willpower questing pretty well, but at the present moment, the Hobbit deck doesn't even come close to the amount of questing ability that something like Dwarves or Outlands can bring to bear. But let's move on to our leadership cards, the first of which is a new version of Denethor, this time a unique leadership ally with a cost of 4, 3 willpower, 1 attack, 2 defense, 3 hit points, and the Gondor and Noble traits. He reads, Denethor gets minus 1 willpower for each damaged hero you control, and you discard Denethor if his willpower is 0 or less. So, I think immediately he has pretty stellar willpower for a leadership character. The cost of four is on par with a lot of other unique characters we've seen, and he's actually got a pretty reasonable defensive value. I think that cost of four is very affordable in leadership, and if you don't happen to be running the likes of Baragond and Gondorian Shield, he can definitely make a pretty reasonable defender. Yeah, I agree. I, I think he certainly has nice stats. If you're playing with the leadership version of Boromir, he's attacking for two. I, I think, though, to get the most bang for your buck out of this particular ally, you're going to want some sort of healing either in your own deck or in those that you're playing with. Elrond, for example, could work the, the core set version of Glorfindel or any other host of healing effects because it's not going to be that difficult for all of your heroes to get damaged, certainly in quests that are heavy in archery or whatever else, and then Denethor will be discarded. I think even the new tactics card we'll be discussing in just a moment could help him out, help keep him on the table. Otherwise, I think in some ways he's, he's rather fragile. But provided that you have some sort of contingency to help keep him on the table, I think he's a solid addition to almost any leadership deck, in particular um, a Gondor deck. He definitely does kind of strike me as a not necessarily high-risk, high-gain type of character, because it is only three willpower, but there's definitely going to be certain scenarios where this just plain doesn't work. I'm picturing the characters all commit to the quest, you pull a one damage to each character type effect, a couple heroes take a point of damage, and then his willpower drops down to one, or potentially nothing, and then he ends up being discarded. So I think there are some situations where he'll work great. The Gondor synergy isn't quite as developed as I'd like it to be, but there are effects like for Gondor to boost up his defense a little bit more, even though he's not a hero. And then there's also the tactics event behind Strong Walls, so you can boost up his defense and have him defend against multiple enemies each turn. I just definitely think you need to take a careful look at what scenario you're playing before you bother including this guy. I suppose really the last thing there is to say is if another player is running the hero version of Denethor, then your decision as to whether or not to include him in your deck in the first place is pretty much made for you. I suppose one final thought about our new unique ally is 
particularly if you're playing a very leadership heavy deck, it's quite possible that you're running Aragorn and attached to him Sword That Was Broken, which provides a passive, constant willpower benefit to all characters you control. So even if you're playing a scenario where on occasion all of your heroes might take damage, that nevertheless provides an excellent source of insurance to keep Denethor in play so that eventually you can bring your powerful healing effects to bear, strip the damage off your heroes, and then continue questing round after round with a powerful 4 willpower Denethor. So our final leadership card of this adventure pack is Lord of Morthond. It's a one cost attachment, uh, it's a title, and it must attach to a Gondor or Outlands hero. If each hero you control has the printed leadership resource icon, Lord of Morthond gains response. After you play a lore, spirit, or tactics ally, draw one card. So this is for a mono leadership deck, and if you're not playing Outlands with Herolin's ability to pay for allies of any spheres, you'd probably need songs to pull this particular card off. Otherwise, I think it's more often than not going to be played in an Outlands deck, and this is basically the Outlands version of Legacy of Durin, which was you play a dwarf, you draw a card. This is almost the same thing. You play an Outlands ally, you draw a card. So in that sense, Legacy of Durin has certainly proven to be a powerful card and a staple of most dwarf decks. I would imagine that this is going to be a very powerful and staple of Outlands decks to help them pump out their allies even more quickly, which a lot of Outland decks have been using Barevor to accelerate their card draw to get those Outlands allies. And this is a way, again, if you, you cannot use her because she is not a leadership hero, so just a little bit of way to get some, some card draw here. So yeah, if you're going to play Outlands, I see no reason to not include this card in your deck. It's sort of a shame that it doesn't have the Outlands trait, because then it could work with Hunter of Lamadon. But with that said, I still think it, it's worth including, and it's a quite powerful card. I definitely like that this card is cheap, and it certainly provides an alternative to players that aren't interested in running lore. So just like you mentioned Barivor, running a lore hero also gave Outlands players the opportunity to do peace and thought in a number of different extremely powerful card acceleration effects like that. The real problem I have with this card is you have to have all leadership heroes but if you play a leadership character, that does not result in your drawing a card. So if you're running a Gondor deck, you have to be playing Tactics Allies or, God forbid, Lore or Spirit Allies. And if you are playing Outlands, every time you play Forlong or Warrior of Losernok, even Errand Rider and Snowborn Scout, none of those trigger an additional card in your favor. And the same thing can be said of Envoy of Pelargir, where neutral characters, including Gandalf, don't result in a card draw either. So I think in a conventional Outlands deck, you've got your Ethere Swordsmen, you've got your Hunters of Lamadon, your Knights of the Swan, and your Anphalos Herdsmen. But apart from that, I'm not really running any lore, spirit, or tactics allies. So drawing 12 cards is certainly good, but then you have to include multiple copies of this to make sure that you draw it. If it ends up getting drawn later than you'd like it to be, it's not nearly as useful, so it's certainly going to get better and better the more non-leadership Outlands characters we get, and the same thing goes for Gondor, but at the moment I'm pretty hesitant to pull Barivor out of my Outlands deck. And then, of course, the other trick with this card is you have to figure out what heroes you want to run. So Herluin is obvious, Theodrid is certainly useful doing resource acceleration, but do you want to run Aragorn with his 12 threats and some additional actions that are useful in the early game? The same thing could be said for Prince Imrahil, or do you want to run maybe something like Glowin, so he can amass a bunch of damage to save your weak Outlands allies in the early game, and then maybe even parting gifts that to another player. But I think probably the most popular option at this point is probably Balin, to do a little bit of shadow cancellation, and if it just so happens that you're running Outlands, another player is running Dwarves, with access to the potent Dwarf synergy, I really think that two-player deck combo could be extraordinarily powerful. So 
All in all, I think this is an interesting card, but at this point in this adventure pack, I think this one's yet to win me over. I think one final thing worth mentioning about Lord of Morthond is that by no means are players excluded from using this outside of a Gondor or Outland-centric deck. The Mono Leadership Dwarf deck comes to mind, where that player is almost guaranteed to be taking advantage of Steward of Gondor, which, beyond just accelerating that player's resource production, it also gives the attached hero the Gondor trait. And if you're a little bit lucky with your sequence of drawn cards, you can attach Steward of Gondor to one of your Dwarven heroes, and then affix the Lord of Morthond attachment. So, even though that doesn't allow that player to circumvent the normal pitfalls of this attachment, namely only benefiting from that card draw when non-leadership allies interplay, it can nevertheless result in a vastly increased net gain of cards, certainly something far beyond what King Under the Mountain could accomplish by itself. And especially considering that player won't have access to Ori, and is unlikely to be able to put things like Legacy of Durin on their characters, so long as they're running songs or the dwarf exclusive Narvi's Belt, I think that this could nevertheless be another card advantage option for players willing to take a bit of a risk when it comes to deck building. I think my absolute final thought about Lord of Morthond is if you are bothering to take advantage of having all leadership heroes, since Outland's characters normally have extremely high willpower, attack, and defense, that card's strength of arms is absolutely perfect, where for an investment of two resources, which if you're playing all leadership is practically nothing, can ready a ton of Outlands characters. So while Lord of Morthon by itself doesn't blow me away, that is an extraordinarily powerful combination. But on to our tactics cards, the first of which is a unique attachment called the Book of Eldakar. It is cost of four and has the record trait. It reads, attached to a tactics hero, reduce the cost to play Book of Eldakar by one for each hero you control with a printed tactics resource icon. And action, discard Book of Eldakar to play any tactics event card in your discard pile as if it were in your hand. Then place that event on the bottom of your deck. So, if you're running through a lot of cards, if you're running an event-heavy deck, this certainly gives you an opportunity to recycle some of those. Potentially, you could play one event three times, you could play it from your discard pile three times. If you happen to cycle through your deck, you could play it another three times. But the big trick with this one is there aren't necessarily a ton of stellar tactics events that make this worth running. This card sort of makes me think of Hama, but it's a, a less superior version of, of Hama's ability. And as I mentioned in our previous card review, these mono sphere cards, at least so far, and now we're halfway through the cycle, aren't shoring up the weaknesses of the individual spheres, which to me makes the cards even worse. So, Mitch, you were talking about potentially playing cards three times. Well, that's just not going to happen. Anyone who's played Tactics knows that card draw is probably the biggest disadvantage. And while there's one card, Foe Hammer, that allows that to kind of happen, there's typically too many contingencies. And in my experience, I either have Foe Hammer in my hand, but no weapon. I've got a weapon in play, but no Foe Hammer. And they never seem to meet up with one another. And even Still, you then have to kill an enemy, exhaust the weapon, and draw some cards. With that said, you also have to discard the book itself, which is beyond annoying. Uh, you could maybe get it, other players could get it back for you, maybe with uh, Erebor Hammersmith or something, but it's basically a one-shot. You get to use the card one more time, and then it's at the bottom of your deck, and you will probably never see it again. So... Uh, I, I think it could be helpful, but you're basically paying one to recast a card and and, and then lose this book. I, I am just not keen on this in any way, shape, or form. It will probably never be included in my decks, I don't think. It's just far too limited in its ability. And even if it's stuck around forever and you get to reuse something in your discard pile and it goes in the bottom, I might like that a little bit more. But the fact that you have to discard this book and that it's unique, so you can't have it loaded up on all of your heroes and have three sitting there waiting to be used, 
it just just far too many contingencies, far too many drawbacks. And while I love tactics and recycling events would be a good thing, if you need to do that, I think Hama's uh, the, the better way to go. You mentioned one weakness of tactics being card draw, and I think this also doesn't address the other, which is resource acceleration. So outside of things like Horn of Gondor, tactics doesn't really have a lot of means to get more than, say, three resources per turn. And the book itself, even if you're running three tactics heroes, still costs one. So if you want to play a zero-cost card from your discard pile, it's essentially an investment of an additional resource. Because you're not only paying for this card, but you're also paying the full price of whatever's coming out of your discard pile. So for that reason, if you're going to try and get this card to work, I think it's great if you've got a leadership player that can help accelerate your resources. But just like you pointed out, card advantage is really going to prevent this card from seeing much play. There are a ton of different events that this can be reasonable with, but the number that strike me as maybe one day becoming effective is pretty limited. I think my personal favorites might be trained for war. If you're really trying to get that mono tactic stack to be able to do traditional willpower questing, being able to recycle that event is pretty invaluable, but just like you said, for consistency, Hama absolutely cannot be beat. Something else that's probably worth considering is Hands Upon the Bow, so you can keep picking off enemies in the staging area, and in that case, unless you gave Hama the ranged keyword, he wouldn't really be able to do that for you, he wouldn't necessarily be able to recycle that as easily, and then maybe something like The Eagles Are Coming, just to help tactics all the more because their card advantage is so terrible. Right. As we so often say, and I think it's magnified with tactics because of the card draw issue, is this a card you're really going to want to draw for any of your draws? An opening hand card? Well, that's one thing. But if I was to draw this card, it could in some situations be a lifesaver because there's an event in my discard pile that I could really use. But, but all things being equal, I think this card would be dead on arrival most of the time. I'd rather draw something else. But even still, right, you know, you get the card for one more time, and maybe that will be enough to help you win the particular quest. Uh, hands upon the bow or train for war, but again, then it the book goes away, so you can't use it again. And train for war, or hands upon the bow is on the bottom of your your deck, as opposed to again Hama recycling them. So it really is just getting one card twice, and that's it. So is it really worth including a couple copies of this to have one event be used twice? when Hama is a far superior option and more consistent because it's not dependent on drawing this particular book. To me, there's just no doubt in my mind as to which I would prefer. I think one final thought for this card is that not that I think the Hobbit synergy is ever going to develop to the point where we have, say, three Hobbit tactics heroes, but if you are going for a style of play where you're keeping your threat value extraordinarily low, if you're not running dwarf characters, the only other event I can think that might be worth recycling with this is something like Unseen Strike. The final tactics card of this adventure pack is a zero-cost event, Gondorian Discipline. Response, cancel up to two points of damage just dealt to a Gondor character. In a sense, this is quasi-healing, and in that sense, I think it's nice. It also works for heroes or allies, which is also nice. But since it's not healing, it can't be comboed with things like Elrond. Uh, and again, it is limited to Gondor characters. So it's, as I mentioned earlier with Denethor, this is one way to perhaps extend the life of Denethor by preventing damage from ever getting on your heroes in the first place. It's an interesting card. I don't dislike it in a sense, but I always sort of come back to, is this a card you're going to want to draw? Do I think it could be a lifesaver in certain situations? Sure. But it's more of a reactive sort of card as opposed to a proactive card. And typically, I tend to prefer proactive approaches to controlling or beating the encounter deck as opposed to waiting around for it to damage me before I can play something. Interestingly, it's really the only Gondor card of the adventure pack, or at least that is having some sort of synergy with Gondor, with the exception of Lord of Morthod, which really is more for Outlands than anything. So 
Again, while I like the card in a precious 50 card slot deck, I just don't think that I will be cutting something out to put this in. But I suppose we have three more adventure packs to go to see how the Gondor trait will be developed, if it even is at all, before I, I think I can make a final judgment on this particular card. I definitely think there are going to be some situations where this can absolutely mean the difference between life or death. So you get a nasty shadow card and the enemy has one higher attack strength than you thought it was going to, so your character would end up dying, you'd lose a hero, and then you'd proceed to give up. So this could certainly be a lifesaver in that situation, but it just seems like there are so many situations where in a 50 card deck, having only three copies of this, you're not going to have this sitting in wait in your hand when you really need it. And because, as we just discussed, card advantage is so limited in tactics, without the help of another player, the consistency with which you're going to draw this just seems pretty poor. So while this can certainly save something like a Defender of Ramas from an untimely death, I can't help but feel for any of our Gondor heroes, something like Gondorian Shield is just so much more useful, and that's a mere cost of one instead of a cost of zero. So just like you said, I like effects that once you play it, it is always there, it's always consistent, it's always reliable. Outside of archery, normally direct damage doesn't happen during the combat phase, but throughout Heirs of Numenor and Against the Shadow, there are nevertheless a few effects here and there that do deal some damage. So I think this can be okay. My major concern is that most of the time this is going to be a pretty weak draw, and compared to something like Warden of Healing or Gondorian Shield, I'm almost always going to opt for those persistent effects. One final thought about Gondorian Discipline is that it does have an advantage over traditional healing effects in that this card triggers a response effect, as opposed to having to rely on an action, as we've seen with so many more traditional healing effects. So if it just so happens that you're running up against an encounter deck that does include a lot of direct damage, I'm thinking of the massing at Osgiliath, wherein defending characters run a pretty high risk of drawing a Wolves from Mordor shadow card. If it just so happens that you find yourself in a situation where you have a character taking more damage than you had anticipated, there isn't always an action window for you to use to take advantage of those normal healing effects. So you can't trigger a Warden of Healing between unveiling that Wolves Shadow card and dealing that damage. But if you've got this response available in your hand, you are welcome to put that into play. So in some cases, this just serves as a reminder for players to be more cognizant of when they should heal. For instance, before they run the risk of pulling a bad shadow card, and in other cases, this could serve as a pretty valuable addition to your deck, especially if you're running mono tactics and don't have that luxury of another player healing for you. But now that we've covered our tactics cards, let's take a look at our new spirit ally, the Minas Tirith Lamprite. For a cost of one, with zero willpower, zero attack, one defense, and one hit point, with the Gondor and Craftsman traits, and response. After an encounter card with Surge is revealed, discard Minas Tirith Lamprite to name enemy, location, or treachery. If the next encounter card revealed is the named type, discard it without resolving its effects. So this is a very cheap spirit ally. It has the Gondor trait, but doesn't really benefit from a lot of the existing Gondor synergy. So it's cheap, certainly, but you can't really use it for very much attacking. Even with effects like four Gondor, it doesn't have much defensive value outside of chump blocking. And if you risk using its ability, whether you hit, whether you whiff, you end up losing this character. Yeah, this is one of the cards that was spoiled on 
Tales from the Cards blog. Uh, FFG is doing a nice job and they're letting various sort of community hubs like Tales from the Card and soon Card for the Rings will be spoiling their own card for, from the sixth adventure pack. So I think Ian's article discusses it quite well over at Tales from the Card. So I'm not going to say too much other than what he said there. And my one comment for me, how I would play this card is a cheap chump, and that is all I wrote down. So it's a one-cost character that can be a nice chump blocker. You know, its ability is quite hit or miss if you don't have some sort of encounter deck scrying, though there is some, certainly mostly in the lore sphere. Interesting card. I'm not one who really enjoys or, or builds decks to scry the encounter deck. There are lots of players who do, lots of deck uh, archetypes that do that are quite powerful. It's just not my particular style of play. So if I was ever to use this guy, it would be under two conditions. One, I'm playing Spirit and I just need cheap chump blockers to round out my allies. Or two, again, if, and, though, and I'm starting to doubt it, but if the Gondor actually has a synergy developed in the next three adventure packs, perhaps he's worth including just for his trait alone. But uh, yeah, I think that pretty much sums up my thoughts on this particular ally. I think the major issue with this guy is that scrying doesn't necessarily do a whole lot. So at the present moment, outside of risk some light, we can only scry one encounter card at a time. So let's say I take a look at the top of the encounter deck and I know that there's a Druidan Thief on top. I still have to basically gamble because I've used my scrying effect to know that there's a surge card coming up. There's no action window between revealing the surge card, scrying, and then triggering this guy. It's just not possible given our rules. So all you can do is break it down mathematically. Is the encounter deck 50% location? So that's your best bet for a guess. It's all up to chance. So I don't like luck-based effects. You're essentially throwing away a resource if this whiffs. Maybe you can use some sort of effect where you're benefiting from a character leaving play, so it's certainly not that big of a deal if you've got Horn of Gondor, so one hero picks up the resource that this guy cost. Whether you're triggering Valiant Sacrifice, that can certainly help. You can use effects like Stand and Fight or Dwarven Tomb to put him back into play, but you know, if I use this guy's ability, if I get burned once, I'm probably only going to be less and less likely to keep triggering this effect. Really, the only other thing I can think of to say about this guy is, while Spirit does have some card advantage, it's by no means lore. And if this is the late game card that you're pulling off the top of the deck, hoping to make all the difference, it's just not going to cut it. I think really the only thing left to say about this character is the same thing that can be said about any Gondor character, is that for that cost of one, you can potentially take advantage of effects like Mutual Accord in order to give this very inexpensive Gondor character access to those Rohan synergy cards. So if you put this guy into play, with the support of a number of other events, he's just one more character to benefit from effects like Astonishing Speed, or We Do Not Sleep, or if a player's running something like Sword That Was Broken or Faramir, so each individual body on the table gets all the more powerful, then that could in and of itself be another reason to consider running the Minas Tirith Lamprite, but Apart from effects like that that really apply to any cheap character, I'm very hesitant to consider including this one in my decks. Our final spirit card for this adventure pack is the one cost event, Small Target. And I'm wondering if this has the most text of any card in the game up to this point. It certainly is quite lengthy, but its response reads, after a Hobbit hero you control exhausts to defend an attack, choose another enemy engaged with you, and reveal the attacking enemy's shadow card. If that shadow card has no shadow effect, resolve this enemy's attack against the chosen enemy. If that shadow card has a shadow effect, resolve this attack as normal. I certainly think this is a neat card. Thematically, it's kind of cool. You've got two big trolls or something attacking you. The hobbit dashes in between them, and the, the troll misses and swings the other troll and knocks him upside the head or something. So it's quite a cool effect. I think it's very thematic. Interestingly, I'm not sure it combos all that well with the hobbit hero in this pack, because Pippin's sending enemies back to the staging area. But 
I think this card definitely has potential. Certainly, again, when Black Riders comes out, this might be a nice card to add into the Hobbit decks that will inevitably be being built next month, I think, when uh, Black Riders is due to be out. But, yeah, I mean, again, at this point, I'm not making a Hobbit deck with our existing Hobbits, but I absolutely like the card. I think it's pretty cool. There are ways to scry shadow effects in case you want to make sure this hits. You could do encounter deck analysis to see how many of the encounter cards have it. So what, what is my shot? Is it a 60-40 chance, 70-30, 50-50, whatever it happens to be? So yeah, it's thematically very cool. I think if you're going to build a Hobbit deck, it's certainly worth including. So yeah, I, I think I don't dislike it in, in any way, shape, or form. I just think Hobbit decks aren't quite there yet, so I don't won't be building one in, in the short term. But once, like I said, once Black Riders is out, I'm sure all of us will be building Hobbit decks just to see how they play. I think this is definitely an interesting effect, because under ideal conditions, not only does it essentially prevent one enemy from attacking, but it can outright kill another, so it totally gets rid of one opponent, and it essentially functions as a feint for the other. If one enemy isn't strong enough to outright kill another one, it can at the very least prevent one enemy attack, but it also has the built-in ability to whiff. I think the big benefit about this card compared to our spirit ally we just talked about is the order in which shadow cards are dealt, even if you're not running Dark Knowledge, like you alluded to, is entirely predictable. It always follows the same pattern. So it's first player working progressively around the table until you get to the last player, from high engagement cost to low. So in some situations, if you are able to scry the top card of the encounter deck, if that's the enemy you want to be triggering this on, and normally high engagement cost enemies are the ones that hit the hardest, that can be a pretty convenient means for players to know whether or not this is going to work. The obvious major pitfall here is if you're doing it blindly, it could result in a dead hero, but if you're running Frodo Baggins, one of our three Hobbit heroes, if it just so happens that you're really counting on this working and it whiffs, he can just take that damage as threat instead. This doesn't do a whole lot of good if you don't have two enemies engaged with you, but under almost any circumstance, it's very easy to just plan ahead. I think really one of the only shames about this is that because the attacking enemy isn't going to have a shadow effect, potentially bolstering their attack strength quite a bit, they aren't always strong enough to kill one another, especially if you've got two copies of the same enemy engaged with you. So this is definitely an interesting card. I think it has fantastic potential. And if through scrying you know it's not going to trigger, I suppose in a desperate situation you could always trigger Pippin or a Light in the Dark to push that enemy away from you back into the staging area. So, on to our lore cards, the first of which is an ally called Ethelian Archer. With a cost of 3, he has 1 willpower, 2 attack, 1 defense, and 2 hit points. He is Gondor and Ranger, and has the ranged keyword. And response, after Ethelian Archer attacks and damages an enemy, return that enemy to the staging area. So, it's a fairly expensive lore ally, it's got reasonable attack strength, ranged is nice, and if for some reason an enemy gets engaged with the wrong player, so long as you're able to hit hard enough to damage it but not kill it outright, you can move that enemy back into the staging area, most likely to be redistributed the following round. Definitely an interesting character. First off, he's a ranger, so that can certainly help with cards like the Overgrown Trail, with its very nasty threat and uh, a lot of quest points. He would be three attack with the leadership Boromir, and I think that's nothing to sneeze at. So just based on his ranged ability, his two traits, and his stats, I think he's, he's quite reasonable. His response, though, is a little bit weird, and I can't help but wonder if we're going to see 
cards that somehow interact with enemies returning to staging area. Pippin returns things to the staging area in this adventure pack. This particular card returns enemies to the staging area. Now Pippin's a bit more obvious in that hobbits can't deal with enemies very well. This guy's a little more mysterious in that why would you really want to do this outside of perhaps redistributing enemies? So I'm wondering if we'll start to see effects that, that really play on this response, but but outside of not really knowing in most cases why you'd want to do this, why wouldn't you simply want to kill it? You mentioned earlier with Pippin, things like the pickpocket or the, all those nasty bandits from the Heirs of Numenor encounter sets. They have to engage again the next turn, which means they're stealing more resources or stealing more cards, which is quite frustrating. I think all things being equal, you want to kill them outright, not damage them and bounce them back. Uh, you know, maybe the great U bow could work, uh, you know, later on, or hands upon the bow, certainly, if the other character has the uh, the possibility of, of doing this. But, yeah, I'm thinking there's got to be more to this guy than, than meets the eye. We're just not there yet. But but I, I might be inclined to include him just as is. One willpower, you know, not horrible, though could be better. But the three attack with the leadership Boromir certainly could be nice. And, as you mentioned, range can always be helpful in a pinch. So, his Art is certainly cool. I like him just on that basis. So again, while part of me wants to say this card is just weird and makes no sense, I can only hope that we'll see something in one of the next three adventure packs that makes this guy make a lot more sense. I think what strikes me as particularly off about this card is that the lore player normally finds themselves in a support role, as opposed to being the brutish hard-hitting, takes all the enemies, tanks them, and destroys them type deck. Uh, and what's odd about this is the support deck taking enemies away from the combat deck and putting those back into the staging area seems rather counterintuitive, so why not keep the enemies engaged with the player that's best able to deal with those? I suppose it certainly is possible in some situations to have an enemy engaged with one player for multiple rounds. During the planning phase, you fill the staging area with traps. Maybe if they don't get set off, you could toss it back to the staging area. You mentioned a number of effects that are pretty reasonable, but for the most part, the attack is nice, ranged is great coming from the support player, but the ability strikes me as just a little bit bizarre. Under normal circumstances, the support player if they take enemies, those are going to be pretty weak, so maybe an Athelian archer and another couple characters are able to band together and trigger this effect, but ideally you're killing that enemy outright. And especially if you've got other ranged attackers from your combat player to help you, it's all the more likely that you're going to kill that enemy. So it's certainly possible for you to trigger this effect, it just seems like something that's very, very rarely going to be of any kind of practical value. So, just like you said, maybe eventually I'll change my opinion of the Athelian Archer, but compared to things like Mirkwood Runner, for instance, outside of relying on leadership Boromir to boost him up to three attack in a sphere where they don't normally have much offensive ability to bring to bear, I think I'm pretty unlikely to be running the Athelian Archer. As one final thought, even though I feel fairly lukewarm at the moment about the Athelian Archer, I nevertheless feel like he's got pretty stellar potential, depending on what else we see for Gondor and the Ranger trait, and taking a look at a couple of our core set allies, I can't help but feel as though power creep is starting to come into play. Just because the Silverload Archer and Horseback Archer, leadership and tactics allies respectively, for the same resource investment have a total of 4 and 5 stat points, whereas the Athelian Archer not only has a grand total of 6, but an ability that can certainly at times prove to be fairly useful. Our final lore card for this adventure pack is the one cost attachment Athelian Pit. It's another trap, and Athelian Pit must be played into the staging area unattached. If unattached, attach Athelian Pit to the next eligible enemy that enters the staging area. Any character may choose attached enemy as the target of an attack. 
An interesting thing about this particular trap, as opposed to some of the others we've seen, is while the enemy is in this pit, it still somehow engages a player. It does leave the staging area. We're not trapping them in the staging area. So really, all this card is doing is basically giving every character, every ally, every hero on the playing surface ranged, because anyone can now attack this dude because he's stuck in a pit, which is interesting in and of itself. I'm not sure I wouldn't prefer some of the other traps better than this one, but certainly lore as the support deck, if you don't have the ability to handle something, you could certainly pull it down to your side, I guess, and everyone can participate in the attack, or if the other players take it but needed one or two extra attack that you happen to have to spare, that could be helpful. It was spoiled quite a while ago. There is a lore character coming up that will recycle traps, so that could be an inherent bonus with this card as well, but it's not my favorite trap of the traps. It's probably my least favorite trap, but it certainly has an interesting effect. I think the most interesting aspect of this card is that it allows Lore to finally do something that Spirit and now Tactics has been able to do for quite a while, which is attack enemies that aren't engaged with you, apart from taking advantage of the ranged keyword. So Spirit has always had Dune here, and in the not-so-distant past, Tactics gained great U bow. So you play this into the staging area. Ideally, it triggers on a desirable target like some big nastiness or an extraordinarily high engagement cost enemy. And then all of a sudden, every single character on the entire table is eligible to attack that enemy. What kind of stinks about this is if characters don't have ranged, each individual player has to declare their attacks separately, so that enemy's defense strength has to be overcome each and every time, but if you've got a lot of leftover actions at the end of the turn, maybe it just so happens you've got enough characters that can band together to end up contributing, or in some cases dealing some really serious damage. Under ideal circumstances, players are able to destroy enemies outright before they happen to engage with them. So if you've got Umbar Assassin with engagement cost of 40 sitting there in the staging area, if you're able to bring to bear sufficient attack strength to kill it, you never have to stomach that forced effect when it engages with you, whether it simply deals damage or instantly kills a hero. This certainly works very well on enemies that repeatedly return to the staging area. I just think the major difficulty with this card is if you're filling the staging area with traps, they're all going to trigger on one enemy. And unless you're scrying, it can be pretty difficult to get this on a desirable target. But considering that the Hobbit trait from what we've seen so far seems like it wants to keep players at an extraordinarily low level of threat, this could someday be a pretty reasonable addition to a Hobbit deck. Our final card of this adventure pack is Hobbit Sense. It's a neutral event with a cost of two, and reads, Play only if each of your heroes is a Hobbit. And combat action. Enemies engaged with you do not attack this phase. You cannot declare attacks this phase. So, we mentioned earlier that the Hobbit synergy seems to, I think you use the term, Matthew, tread water. It kind of delays the inevitable, or postpones enemy attacks, hoping that you can quest to the very end and end up surviving, maybe eking out a victory. And I think that this card perfectly exemplifies this. So, you have to be using all Hobbits, you can't deal damage, you can't really take damage, this is great if you have another player, but if you're solo, you've definitely got to make sure that you've got multiple copies of this or other tricks to rely on just in case you find yourself with a lot of enemies engaged with you and no way left to evade them. This is the Hobbit version of the core set tactics card Thicket of Spears, and it happens to cost one less. You know, I think Thicket of Spears is a great card, minus its sort of inherent drawback of having to pay out of three different heroes' resource pools. But, you know, if I think Thicket of Spears is pretty good, then of course Hobbit Sense is pretty good. But, but you're absolutely right, it is only delaying the inevitable. But again, that could be enough. If your buddy's playing a ranged deck, they could maybe help out with the attacks, or 
some other sort of tricks. So interesting card. I think it's a nice card. Again, with the Hobbit synergy in its infancy, we'll have to see what Black Rider throws our way as far as Hobbit decks are concerned. But certainly it's a worthy contender at this point to help the Hobbits survive. I do definitely like that this can prevent an infinite number of attacks, so it's not like faint. There's no upper limit on the number of attacks that you're preventing, and it definitely does help you to stall. So you can occupy enemies for a long time with multiple copies of Hobbit Sense, if you've got multiple copies of Out of Sight, it can certainly feel like you're staving off enemy attacks almost indefinitely, but you just want to make absolute certain that you've got some way to push to the end. So it's fantastic to get all that threat out of the staging area. Just like we mentioned for some other cards, it doesn't prevent you from stomaching nasty when it engages with you type effects, but I definitely think there are many scenarios where if you can have one player lock down a lot of enemies, it can make questing to the very end a hell of a lot easier. Something that can restrict the usefulness of this card is that we've seen a bunch of different scenarios in which there's one powerful adversary that has to be destroyed before the players can win the game. And if you're in a solo environment, if you've been using this to tank a bunch of enemies, preventing all of their attacks, you don't get to attack them back either. So if you are engaged with multiple enemies and you have to destroy one of them, unless you've got some sort of clever means of dealing with the extraneous enemies, you could potentially find yourself in a sticky situation where you have too many enemies engaged with you to easily deal with. So you could become overwhelmed with the sheer volume of attacks against you in attempt to destroy that one scenario-specific enemy. For that exact reason, I think this card absolutely shines in a multiplayer game. So you can amass a bunch of enemies, prevent a lot of different attacks, and keep a ton of threat out of the staging area, and rely on other players, perhaps with ranged heavy decks, to direct attacks over to those enemies engaged with you, so they can be safely and efficiently destroyed before you run out of tricks and can push to the end of the scenario. But, I suppose that brings our adventure pack to a close, so Matthew, any overall impressions about our encounter at Amon Den player cards? Sure. The first adventure pack of this cycle, I think, can aptly be called the Outlands Adventure Pack. The second one, I think, again, I could call the Monosphere Adventure Pack. And the third one would be the Hobbit Adventure Pack. It seems to be the recurring theme. And, and as I've said so far every video, nary a Gondor card in sight, with few very limited, not all that useful exceptions. I feel like I've been pretty critical of the adventure packs to date, but to be completely honest, I've been very underwhelmed with, with every adventure pack. You know, back in uh, Shadows of Mirkwood and Dwarf of Cycle and certainly the Hobbit Sagas, every pack had one or two, if not more cards that I was very interested in trying out and including and updating my decks. With the exception of the Gondorian Shield, for my normal tactics play, there hasn't been a single card I've been interested in for my sort of general purpose decks. And as I mentioned a video or so ago, I'm not interested in building an Outlands deck at this point. And Hobbit decks, I'm not sure if they're quite there yet. So I might try it, but I just don't know. So for me, so far the cycle is 0 for 3. I'm not a big fan of any of the player cards yet revealed. So I don't want to completely hate on the cycle, but I have little hope that a Gondor synergy will emerge triumphant to be on par with dwarves or the Outlands characters by the end of the cycle. Now certainly there have been themes to the adventure pack, so if the next three adventure packs are heavy Gondor, then perhaps the synergy will be bolstered, but again, we're only getting six cards per sphere. That's all that's left in the remaining packs, not counting heroes, of course. But um, yeah, I, the, the whole the cycle as a whole, I, I've not been too thrilled with. We'll see if it ends on a high note. As far as these particular cards, Denethor could be okay in some situations, 
Gondorian Discipline may be. The most interesting card to me is perhaps Small Target, but I'm still reserving judgment to really see how the Hobbit decks shape up with the four new Hobbit heroes we're getting in the Black Rider Saga expansion. Athelian Archer, I'm curious to see what his ability will end up doing. I hope it's something they plan on developing instead of simply just bouncing back, because that seems a bit weird. But yeah, I think unless I build a Hobbit deck for our Progression Series playthroughs of this cycle, which I very well may, I think almost all of these cards are going to be sitting in my binder for quite a while. I definitely have to agree with you that I think this is probably the single most underwhelming adventure pack in this cycle, at least, that we've seen thus far. Uh, it felt very bizarre having this adventure pack come out, and then maybe two or three weeks later, we ended up getting a spoiler article that unveils a new, in many ways better version of Pippin that's going to be coming out in our Black Riders set. So given that the Hobbit trait isn't that powerful at the moment, and that our three existing Hobbit heroes don't necessarily mesh together extraordinarily well to create a powerful deck, I really wonder if this version of Pippin is ever going to see much play. It's certainly possible, but at the present state of the game, I'm definitely not looking to build a deck around Pippin, since his ability only comes into effect if you control all Hobbit heroes. I think Denethor is alright, but there are a lot of scenarios where he's just simply not going to work. Like we just finished the Druidan Forest, and Denethor is almost the worst card imaginable to play in that scenario, because you're just going to end up wasting all of those resources when your heroes all get damaged. I think Lord of Morthond can be okay, but again, excluding leadership allies, I think you're missing out on a ton of potential card draw. The tactics cards, at least at the moment, are relatively underwhelming. The spirit cards we talked about, the ally to me, just like you said, is basically a chump blocker. I like that small target has some serious potential, but I feel like it nevertheless has the chance of being a real heartbreaker. So there are going to be times when it's just incredible, but it's also going to leave players with a pretty bad taste in their mouths. Even if you've gotten Dark Knowledge going, if it doesn't happen, I think you're seriously going to be disappointed. It almost boggles my mind as to why Athelian Archer, why that ability isn't on a tactics character. So I certainly look forward to seeing what, if anything, happens with that guy. Athelian Pit is okay, but a little underwhelming. Almost pains me to say it, but I think the best card in this adventure pack is kind of a toss-up between Hobbit Sense and Lord of Morthond. And the only reason I even consider that event is just throughout the course of the six upcoming Lord of the Rings saga expansions, there has to just be innumerable developments of the Hobbit trait. So I'm curious to see what happens in the rest of the Against the Shadow cycle, but thus far, apart from the obviously powerful Outlands characters, I'm just yet to be blown away. So, I hate to end another card review video on a bit of a sour note, but I think that brings us to a close. Thank you, as always, for checking out yet another entry in the LOTR LCG Progression series. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit that like button, subscribe to our channel if you have not done so already. Feel free to leave a comment below if you have a different opinion on any of these player cards. It doesn't sound like Matthew or myself had a very favorable opinion of any of these, so if you've got different thoughts, be sure to fill us in. Up next is going to be our actual playthrough of the encounter at Amon Din scenario, so we'll see you again soon.